So, hey everyone, I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, April 22nd, 2016. Uh, we got a good show for you today. We're going to be talking about, oh, I lost my list, uh, <laughs> babies in space. Uh, uh, what went wrong with Hitomi? Uh, lone planetary mass, object found, uh, and ultra cool polar regions of Venus's atmosphere. Uh, so, joining us this week, we've got our regular cast of characters and a special guest. So, I will start with the regular cast first, and then we get to our special guest, which you heard the spoiler alert earlier already. So, Kimberly Cartier, welcome. Hello, Fraser. Hello, viewers. We got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Happy Friday. You were sorely uh, missed. Oh, I were, sorely missed it. People were sad. Um, and, as I mentioned, special guest, uh, who I think has been on the Weekly Space Hangout in the past, is a good friend of the show, Mike Simmons from Astronomers of the Borders. Mike, Hi, Crazy. back. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've been on before, but it's been a while, so it's great to be back on again. Yeah, well, and you joined us for a bunch of the virtual star parties when we used to do those, so yeah, uh, yeah. that was also how you participated, which made a, made a ton of sense, because uh, it was a borderless astronomy get-together. Yeah. Um, so, for people who have no idea who you are, what you do, and what your organization is, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Mike? Well, uh, I'm the founder and the president of Astronomers Without Borders, and uh, we have a worldwide community of astronomer, astronomers and astronomy enthusiasts. Uh, and when I say, you know, when we say international, we, we include Uganda and, and uh, every other country, uh, or Nigeria and so on. Uh, there's astronomy everywhere around the world, and we use that to connect people together through our common passion about astronomy. We share the same sky, we're doing the same things, and we just, you know, people like to share what they're doing and uh, do it together, and that's what we do. Fantastic. Uh, what happens when we have, like, astronomers on the moon? I guess you'll be able to include them, too. Well, somebody did accuse me once of being kind of narrow when I he said we should have been astronomers without intergalactic borders. But, you know, one step at a time. Right, right. If anyone can actually set up a telescope on the moon and, uh, and join, I'm sure they'd be welcome. Well, and we have had, uh, we do have programs where we send radio uh, signals, pictures to the moon and, and receive them back here. And you can see how the uh, interaction with the, the scattering from the lunar surface has affected them when they're reconstructed. So we go to the moon. Perfect. Um, so then let's talk a bit about, about sort of your major project, which is you're sort of in the middle of right now, which is that it's Global Astronomy Month. Yeah. Well, Global Astronomy Month has is, is really taken on a life of its own. And this is a follow-up to the 100 Hours of Astronomy Cornerstone project that I led during the International Year of Astronomy. And we just didn't want to let that die because it was such a huge thing. But it's expanded now into a whole month. And we have observing programs, both local events and online. Uh, uh, the really three types of programs that AWB has all together. Resource sharing programs uh, where we... we uh, share stuff that we have either knowledge or equipment with other countries where they need it. And arts and culture, there's a lot of that. That's something we hadn't envisioned, but the arts community has gotten together and there's a tremendous amount of that going on. And so how can people who are like watching the show right now still get involved? <clears throat> well, you can go to uh, gam, G-A-M hyphen A-W-B dot O-R-G, check the program schedule, see all the things going on. Uh, things you can participate in uh, either online, globe at night um, for measuring the uh, darkness of the skies in your area, uh, <coughs> Cosmic Concert, an online Messier Marathon, lots of events still coming up. Well, so can you give us some, some examples? Get some time. You don't have to give us the quick synopsis. So explain some of these, these projects and, uh, and, and sort of what you're looking to do. Oh, good. Well, I'm going to have that four hours I said I needed. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can give you the full four hours, but I definitely can give you, uh, you know, uh, some time to talk about some of these projects because um, they're pretty exciting. They, they are. Well, let me give some examples of what's been going on around the world so far during Global Astronomy Month. And so I'm going to start up the screen sharing here to show you some pics. 
Okay, so here we've got an example. This is just typical. This is in the Philippines. It's sidewalk astronomy. It's a thing that all of us do, free telescope uh, viewing, and people lining up along the street there uh, in Manila, I believe. So that's just kind of typical of, of uh, what goes on. And let me, um, let's see, get back to, uh, okay, I'm still screen sharing. Yep. I need to um, stop that. Okay, so yeah, I don't have them lined up perfectly. Let me, um, there we go. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, there we go, I love this. This is in Japan. And uh, they're having like a camp out there. They've got tents there. It's in a park. And see the typical sort of Japanese lanterns there, uh, letting people see around. Um, let's see. Got. Oh, I, this, these are just too good. In India, this is a, a group that's got, um, you know, our, our motto there one people, one sky. Global Astronomy Month, and let's see if I can get to each one this way, so I don't have to keep changing. Yeah, that didn't work, did it? Oh, uh, you can we have, move between them with the arrows there. Yeah, and so now I've got. Uh, so this is, you know, we have some things, uh, new thing this this time done by John Goss, the president of the Astronomical League, who uh, made up some various challenges observing challenges for people to give a try and report on. This is somebody who on the Lunar Challenge just took a, a photo and, and uh, posted that. And we have reports of various kinds going on and I keep going through that. It's not working well, is it? Uh, let's see. Oh, another good one in uh, Vietnam. They had an actual sort of a camp out there for their star party. That's awesome. Um, yeah, oh, some good ones. Um, let me share this one. Now, this, is, this one's a little better organized. Let me get it down. So this is the global star party in Romania, which has got a lot of stuff going on. Um, I love this one. The kids skated by and stopped to look through the telescope. And there's a, you know, this is something, this is the payoff for all of us amateur astronomers who do outreach. This is the, the wow moment for some young child who knows where that's going to lead. Yeah, it's always great when you do this kind of sidewalk astronomy and, and people can't believe that they're seeing Saturn with their own eyeballs. Yep. Uh, that it's actually there and that this isn't some kind of trick or something. It's a it's yeah. a pretty amazing experience when you it's get amazing. a chance to share that with somebody. It um, is, it's cool how it turns all the adults turn into kids again. Oh, that looks great. Um, yeah, th yeah, this is a Messier Marathon in the Philippines and happy campers. Go with it. So... That's a bit of what, what's been reported so far. And there are reports on our website. These are on Facebook. There are a lot of places where you can see what's going on. Right, okay. So, I mean, are these, these events are happening across the entire month. Yes, there's a, the, the Global Star Party is, uh, was, is something that we started in the International Year of Astronomy and is continuing. And that's a specific night. There are certain you know, special things for observing the sun, like Sunday. Clever, mm -hmm. huh? And uh, but some of the programs are are longer. Uh, there's the children's astro art contest that goes through the month, uh, and so there are schools around the world that take part in that every year, and uh, have children submit things. It can be individuals as well. So uh, there are a lot of programs that that are either one-offs or or continuing for a while. So, I mean, I'd love to sort of hear your, you know, you've been doing this for quite a while, you're the founder, you know, how have you found amateur astronomy has sort of changed as a hobby over the time that you've been doing this? How have you found sort of uh, the, whole, the, the whole hobby has evolved? Well, over the time I've been doing it covers a lot of territory. So uh, when my friend Galileo and I were, were right. checking out this guy, <clears throat> but yeah, I started... 45 years ago, and um, it, it was quite different then. The amateur telescope making was was a big thing. 
uh, commercial products weren't that readily available. Most people had, you know, if you had an 8-inch telescope, that was pretty big. Uh, so there are huge changes with that. There's so much available. And I'd say in the last 10, 15 years, what's made a big difference is that even in developing countries, places where it used to be a, a pair of binoculars was, was a treasure, they have really good scopes now. So we do help people to get scopes in some places where it's still just impossible, they're just not available, or they don't have the money, but it, it's really expanded a lot. The other thing, of course, is online. There are resources available to everybody around the world now, uh, virtually. And and I find that uh, you know amateurs are are sort of a lot more respected by the professionals now, and there's a much better collaboration that happens. So so you mentioned there's something going on with the AVSO. I'd like to hear a bit more about that. Well, yeah, and that is a big difference because in the 70s, professionals had no use for amateurs. They they were just a nuisance. But now there's a lot of citizen science going on, and uh, that that's one of the things that's happening. And and also, you know what? Another change is that. Professionals, the young professionals are particularly interested in doing outreach. They want to share the same way the amateurs did. They are not just scientists, they're really enthusiasts and what they want to share it with everybody else. And the amateurs are the ones who are really doing it. They're the pros at doing the outreach and there's a lot of respect for them that way. Citizen science, of course, is another matter where they're actually contributing to science. We have a new program with, uh, in conjunction with the AAVSO, American Association of Variable Star Observers. And this one is really for the real beginners. Even if you just have a pair of binoculars or even some stars that are naked eye, better with a pair of binoculars, a very small telescope. This is something that's been going on for, I don't know, more than 100 years. And uh, th this is monitoring variable stars um, for the purposes of science. And there, there are always even bright ones that need to be followed and they need reports on. But this is a way to get into it in the simplest possible way. So we have a program on our site. We have a forum where there are people from AVSO answering questions. Uh, and you know, one thing that's, I, I've always gotten questions about in other countries that I go to is what else can we do? What more can we do in astronomy than maybe just looking and doing outreach, which they do a lot? This is an answer to that. This is something people have been doing for a long time. A lot of people get into and do their whole lives. Right, right. Uh, and so, you know, what are some some projects like, you know, as astronomy, Global Astronomy Month starts to, to wrap up, you know, here we are on the 22nd of April. So what is sort of still left that people can can get involved in? Well, things that will continue that have been introduced, one thing that I particularly like and is, is going to be a really big thing that we've just started, and I'm even going to share some, some pictures here, is, um, okay, get organized here, there, is uh, what we call faces of astronomy. Because one of the fascinating things about um, astronomy and about Astronomers Without Borders is that we are sharing things from from all over the world and seeing how we do things similarly and so what's happening is that people are uh, that for this project we're asking people to just submit a picture of themselves doing astronomy or let's see find another one here that's uh, well, that's a tiny one but let me go for that and I guess I got to explain cause because we have people who actually listen to this as a podcast. I have to I guess explain what what some of the pictures oh. are, that are that are being shown right now. Okay. But uh, well, that was a picture um, of uh, Raoul Lenoy from who's a, our national coordinator for uh, Belgium, and this is a picture of uh, Marina Sobina Yu in the Philippines. And these are pictures of them in the way they present themselves involved in astronomy. In this case, Marina with a uh, couple of telescopes there, so it looks like she's in a store. And and people, are, sometimes it's just a short paragraph. In Marina's case, she just posted to a blog and said, there are so many ways that I love astronomy that uh, I'm just going to point you to my blog post, and, and you can read it there. Um, we have people, stories on there now from Brazil, U.S., Morocco, Nicaragua. Um, let's see. Boy, I don't even remember where this one is. <laughs> so I got another question. This is a question that we get a lot, and I think you'd probably be the perfect 
person to answer this question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, which is which telescope do you recommend that people get? Oh well, <clears throat> that's yeah. like answering the question what what car should people buy? You know, and it, it's so so okay. Answer. I can I can constrain it a bit more. So let's say that you're a person who uh, is has always been interested in astronomy, likes looking at the pictures on the internet, listens to these you know the shows that we do and wants to just sort of start into the hobby uh, and have a you know a reasonable satisfactory experience in in looking through telescope and not feeling like you've got something that is either too expensive or just doesn't do the trick okay well if I got a telescope for you so <laughs> and uh, thanks to Celestron which is our major sponsor who has sourced this for us and made it all possible we do have a telescope that has been very very popular and been recommended in a lot of places and that is our one sky telescope it is a collapsible five inch tabletop Dobsonian which means that you just set it on the table no no tripod and so on it's really ideal for beginners it's used a lot for outreach and and uh, advanced amateurs use it quite a bit as their grab-and-go telescope you know the the basic rule is the best telescope for you is the one you use and if you have a 10 inch telescope and you never get it out it's not the right one so because Celestron highly subsidizes this by making it possible bringing it over and everything else it sells for $200 uh, including shipping it's only available in the US we get a lot of grief for that but you can buy it elsewhere as the Skywatcher Heritage 130 uh, if it's available in your country but you'll pay more for it and that's why we cannot compete with Skywatcher in other countries their sister companies Right, right, right. And, and I mean, people have even used that telescope for doing some astrophotography and, you know, yeah. it's, a great, it's a great way to kind of get, to get into the, the start of it, which yeah. I think that's great. Yeah, the astrophotography requires taking the optical tube and putting it onto a tracking mount unless it's just quick snaps of the moon or something. That's a more complicated thing, but people do, do go that route as well. well. There's some great people that are doing uh, what we call iPhone, astro, what, iPhone astro iPhoneography um, but you know there's clips you can take your iPhone take the you know your your mobile phone sort of port it into the front of the telescope and be able to actually record video and then once you've recorded the video you can then run that through the various stacking programs and get some great images that are surprisingly you know surprisingly good so I mean the the modern tools really give us a lot of options to be able to do this kind of thing. I don't know, for me, astrophotography is really like the, the rabbit hole. Like that's when the hobby, like once you start to go down that route and start to get access to, to the you're taking pictures and you're going, you know, you're cleaning them up in Photoshop and stuff, that's when it gets pretty addictive. Yeah, that that's absolutely true. Uh, I've had a lot of friends who I've lost to that hobby. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, it's very sad. You just never see them again. They, they're they're up all night and uh, sleep all day. Now it really is a fantastic hobby, and that's true. The modern tools do allow you to do a lot of things. And you know, at first I kind of poo pooed the the idea of using cell phones, but I've seen people take pictures. You know, I'm at Mount Wilson Observatory too, and I've seen guests take pictures through the 60 and 100 inch telescopes with phones, which seems like kind of a mismatch. But you know, they can work out pretty well. Yeah, it's amazing the level of the optics. I mean, the, the light sensitivity is a bit of a problem, but with for bright objects where they're just recording video, it, it works out really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so let's um, let's give people a bunch of links and and places to go so that they can actually sort of get involved, and then we'll move to the news. But I know that you were going to stick around, and and uh, you know I'll throw a few uh, questions your way as we uh, as we go through it and, and get your and get your ideas. So sure. so where can people find out more? Well, for Astronomers Without Borders, there is astronomerswithoutborders.org. And because it happens to us frequently, and just recently happened to me when I was a speaker somewhere and they misspelled our name, Borders is B-O-A-R-D-E-R-S, not B-O-A-R-D-E-R-S. Like not snow about, borders. Yeah, yeah right. So, um, so astronomerswithoutborders.org. Actually, there is a shortcut that I believe is still working, astrowb.org. There is a link there under Programs to a Global Astronomy Month, or go directly to it at gam-awb.org. 
There's a link in the main menu to our store if you're interested in seeing the One Sky Telescope, and you can do a search on that and find all kinds of reviews from space.com and so on. Uh, that'll get you just about everywhere. That sounds fantastic. Are you on the social medias? We are. We've got a Facebook uh, page, Astronomers Without Borders, as well as Global Astronomy Month, two pages. Uh, Twitter is awb underscore org, and there is a GAM one. Don't remember for sure exactly what that is, right, but okay. it's on there. No problem. It'll, it'll all be linked there. Well, so uh, so thanks, Mike, and 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 you know, uh, you know, you and I have talked for years, and I just want to let you know how much I really appreciate uh, all of the organizing and awareness, and you know proselytizing you have been doing for astronomy. It's absolutely wonderful, and I know, uh, you know, the amateur astronomy community and just people who want who love space in general really appreciate it, so thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. It's been great. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to the rest of the news. I just want to remind you that this is a live interactive show, so you can uh, comment in the chat, and that's over on YouTube, and there's the chat going on right now. I can see all kinds of people saying all kinds of things, so go ahead and, and do that, uh, and then we will try and answer some, some questions. Um, all right, Morgan, let's move on to, I guess, what is sort of the big, big story here is uh, Potomi dead. That's right. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about how uh, the Japanese space agency JAXA's Hitomi X-ray telescope uh, had been spinning out of control and appeared to break up into a number of pieces. Uh, and although they're still attempting to contact uh, what remains of the spacecraft, uh, JAXA did release this week uh, their first sort of internal report about what went wrong with uh, the spacecraft. And it highlights kind of interestingly how these spacecraft work and what can happen when one thing goes wrong that will then cascade into a whole series of failures. And so about two weeks ago, after operating successfully for a month, uh, the computer on board Hitomi uh, reported that it was suddenly spinning very quickly. Uh, and in particular, this device called the internal reference unit, which is kind of like a gyroscope sensor that measures the rotation of the spacecraft, said, oh no, we're spinning at 21.7 degrees every hour. Now normally when this happens, the first thing that the spacecraft computer would do is check with the backup uh, positioning system. And those are usually uh, star trackers, which are sensors placed around the spacecraft that look for patterns of stars, match them to known catalogs, and can determine very accurately and very quickly what the position uh, of the spacecraft actually is. And if that position is changing, you know you're rotating. Unfortunately, uh, the star trackers uh, were not turned on for some reason at that point. Uh, and so all the information that the command and control computer on Hitomi had was that, oh no, we're spinning at 21.7 degrees every hour. And it began to take action to correct this. Uh, and the sensible action that it took is to spin up the spacecraft's reaction wheels. Now, reaction wheels uh, are something we've talked about in the past on this show, uh, and they're basically spinning wheels, as they sound, that generate momentum. And as you spin the wheels one way, the spacecraft, due to conservation of angular momentum, is going to spin the other way. And so it began to spun these wheels opposite the direction that it was detecting a spin at. Now, of course, this 21.7 degree spin wasn't real. The uh, sensor was malfunctioning and not reading uh, the correct true value. Hitomi was actually completely stationary. And so as these reaction wheels start to spin up, the spacecraft begins to spin. But because the sensor is still stuck, it still says, oh no, we're spinning at 21.7 degrees per hour still. And the wheels begin to spin faster and faster and faster. And once they get sort of towards their design limit, there's this device called a magnetic torquer. And this is designed basically to slow these wheels down so they don't spin out of control. Uh, and for some reason, that magnetic torquer was unable to stop the wheels from spinning uh, at the speed in which they were spinning. And this is when uh, the computer realizes, oh no, something is wrong. And it turns off the reaction wheels, declares an emergency, and enters safe mode. Now this is basically a standard uh, procedure. All sorts of spacecraft, from Kepler last week to New Horizons a week before its flyby, enter safe mode. And what a spacecraft is supposed to do when it enters safe mode is 
point itself directly at the sun, its solar panels directly at the sun, and its radio dish directly at the Earth. So it can get as much power as possible and transmit as much data back and forth with the Earth as possible. And because the reaction wheels, according to the computer, seem to not be working, it switched to the backup method for rotating the spacecraft, which is to use little thrusters located all over the spacecraft. Uh, and in order to figure out how to turn, there's a special sensor on the spacecraft called a solar sensor. And it's supposed to simply determine the direction to the sun. But because this spacecraft was rotating uh, in a way that the computer couldn't understand, the sun sensor couldn't find the sun. And so the thrusters start rotating the spacecraft basically every which way, trying to find uh, the sun. But there was also a problem with the software that controlled the thrusters. And the thrusters, which were supposed to be uh, firing in opposite the direction of the spin, um, begin firing in the same direction of the spin. And what was a survivable uh, 21.7 degrees per hour spin rapidly uh, became uh, a much, much higher spin. And this is suddenly, instead of 20 one and a half degrees every hour, the whole spacecraft was spinning every five seconds. Uh, this is far, far beyond the design uh, limits for a spacecraft of this kind, and it broke up into 11 pieces. Uh, and that is the story we reported on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, most of those small pieces are expected to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere uh, in the next couple of weeks, in which they'll burn up uh, and never hit the ground. Uh, but the main chunk of Hitomi, whatever is left, is expected to remain in orbit uh, through at least 2020, uh, and eventually also will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. What a what a terrible series of events. That's awful. Uh, and it sounds like we can't exactly blame the reaction wheels, the gyros. If anything, they were going too hard. Right. So there were a couple of very clear uh, problems that were identified by this. One problem was that the star trackers are off. It's not uncommon for an inertial reference system to uh, temporarily um, give an incorrect reading. Uh, and that's the whole point of flipping over to the more accurate backup system, uh, which is a little bit more cumbersome to use, but it can quickly determine that their uh, data is an error, and then they just reset the system, and, and everything basically goes back uh, to normal. And so the fact that the star trackers were not taking data for some reason was uh, the first big mistake. And the second big mistake came uh, with the thrusters. Up to the point in which the spacecraft put itself into safe mode, this was more or less a normal spacecraft emergency. Uh, and almost all spacecraft go through these, uh, you know, on a not uh, insignificant uh, basis. Uh, but when the thrusters were activated to start firing and they were pushing the spacecraft in the wrong direction, that's because the uh, engineers for Hitomi hadn't updated the software for the thrusters after they had extended the solar panels. Uh, and you can imagine that uh, just like an ice skater, as you extend your arms, you're going to change the property with which you sp the spacecraft spins as you extend these long solar panels. And you're supposed to use software to tell the thrusters, okay, well, the spacecraft moves differently now. You need to fire in a different way. And they didn't do that. And because of that, when this emergency happened, the, the thrusters were still working in the wrong direction. And instead of firing against the rotation of the spacecraft, they fired with the rotation of the spacecraft. And that what turned what was a manageable uh, role into one that was completely destructive. It's kind of amazing how much power those thrusters had to speed up the spacecraft to that, to that level. You, you'd think that might be one of the... You know, the spacecraft shouldn't be capable of f turning itself so quickly it can tear itself to pieces. Well, at this point, the computer was very confused about the speed at which the spacecraft was turning, and that was part of the problem. The, the, the computer, because of the stuck sensor, still thought it was turning at 21 uh, degrees per hour and was thinking it was firing the thrusters in the opposite direction as that, and thus it wouldn't have ever triggered any sort of internal uh, threshold about that. Yeah, but this is, I mean, I think this is the first time I've ever heard of, of this kind of a series of events tearing a spacecraft apart. It's, and, and as we've, as, you know, that's the running joke in this show is that usually it's the opposite problem. The reaction wheels fail 
and the spacecraft can't turn anymore, and that's what, and, and it's sort of like it's it's not able to sort of perform its function while everything else is working. But in this case, the, you know, it's just this collection of events. So, I mean, obviously now that it's broken apart, there's nothing else you can do. Yeah, they're still hoping to get some contact with it, but that's seeming less and less likely because not only has it broken apart and spacecraft aren't designed to have parts fall off of them, um, but because it's rotating so rapidly, its solar panels are no longer generating any electricity. It's not like plugging a cord in, pulling it out. The solar panels need to see the sun for a few seconds in order to sort of start the flow of electricity. And when you're going completely around every five seconds, that's just not happening. And so the batteries are, are going to drain and die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, are there, have they mentioned, are there any plans to kind of dig into how to stop this from happening? Is it a risk on any other spacecraft? You know, will they launch a replacement? So there's been no talk, as far as I'm aware, so far of launching a replacement. Uh, but surely uh, JAXA will be reviewing its procedures just like any space agency would in the, in the wake of a disaster. And things like not having updated the um, mass profile of the spacecraft and the software for the thrusters uh, is, seems like the sort of procedural thing that could be corrected by you know, inserting a new procedure that you know, you have to send up both profiles before you extend the solar panels and have some provision for ultimately switching between one and the other. Uh, why the star trackers weren't collecting data is a different question. That They'll have to look into were they not collecting data because there was also some sort of technical fault with them or had they been turned off or not programmed to come on for some reason. And again, these are all procedural things uh, that that they'll learn and hopefully share with the community because this may be things that other spacecraft are also susceptible to, not just Japanese spacecraft, but um, ESA, NASA, Chinese, Indian spacecraft could all uh, potentially suffer from similar chain of events. And the best thing we can do now, just like after an airplane accident or a train crash, is learn what went wrong and tell everybody how to stop it from happening in the future. So in the chat, Galaxia asks a great question, which is, what science is lost? So what, what would, um, what are we now not going to be able to answer? So Hitomi was designed to make observations in a different area of the X-ray spectrum than other X-ray telescopes. So we still have Chandra up there. We still have the uh, European XMM telescope. We're both making X-ray observations. Uh, but Hitomi was designed to, to study a different kind of X-ray. And these were X-rays that were emitted from the most extreme events in the universe. Things like merging neutron stars or the accretion disks right at the edge of a supermassive uh, black hole. These release extremely um, uh, powerful X-rays. And that was the sort of thing that uh, Hitomi was designed to to study, and so basically we will, won't be able to make those kinds of observations un until we get another spacecraft up there, because the Earth's atmosphere uh, blocks X-ray light, which is why we're not all sitting here glowing right now. Right, right. Well, that absolutely sucks. Yeah, it's terrible luck. The Japanese have had bad luck with uh, their spacecraft missions in the last few years, and yeah, they hopefully really they'll have more luck in the next one. Um, okay, Kimberly, let's move on to some, some good science news, and let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the, a, a planetary mass object found in a family of stars, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's a very exciting discovery. Um, it's a combination of two different infrared surveys that was able to make this detection, a uh, combination of the two-mass survey, which uh, happened about 10, 15 years ago, and the WISE mission, both studying a, the full sky in the infrared, and comparing the two data sets, which were about uh, 15 years apart, astronomers were able to detect a very tiny, very faint brown dwarf, which is really the mass of a planet, uh, moving independently of any other star. It's part of the TW Hydrae Association, which is very close by to the sun, and it's only about 10 million years old, and this is one of the lowest mass brown dwarfs that we have ever seen. Now, what's particularly interesting about it is that its mass is so low, it's only about five to 10 times the mass of Jupiter itself, which means that we can study this brown dwarf in detail and compare it to similar exoplanets, which we cannot study, and 
what we can learn from that is that even if something appears to be a uh, planetary mass object, it may not be. Uh, because we're pretty sure that even though this object, which is it's called Wise A1147, it's very clever and all that, uh, even though it looks to be like a planet, a gaseous five times the Jupiter-sized planet, it really could not have formed in the same way that a planet did because it's only 10 million years old. And we know that planets take at least 10 million years to form. And if it had formed like a planet did in an accretion disk around the star, it would have taken 10 million years to form and then an extra amount of time to be kicked out of that solar system. Right. So, so then put this how do you think it might have formed? They think it might have formed very similar to any, old, any other star forming uh, out of a large diffuse gas cloud that eventually condenses down under uh, its gravitational pressure and it just collapses down into this very tiny object. So, so that's the main difference between brown dwarfs and gas giant planets is how they form. But but isn't I thought there was sort of a lower limit on what kind of planet could form or what kind of star could form in that kind of method that if you don't have enough mass you just can't get that collapse so what you know does this just sort of push down that what that lower limit might be it could very well do that uh, and we don't have enough information to study the chemical composition of this object and that might be the key because the lower limit you're talking about uh, it's about a tenth of the size of the sun we think is the lowest size, uh, the smallest star that we can have and still fuse hydrogen. And below that limit, you have to get very creative in how you radiate away all of that gravitational heat from the collapse. So you need complex molecules and, on, and a lot of very different things we don't see in regular stars so that an object can continue to collapse and get smaller. So perhaps the chemical composition of this object lets it do that, but it's certainly one of the smallest uh, brown dwarfs we've seen, and we're pretty sure it formed in isolation. So that could that challenges a lot of ideas we have about how these objects can form. But it's in a it's in a star cluster, right? So mm -hmm. so there's a lot of stars and other objects being formed around it. So it could be possible yeah. something got kicked out, maybe, or it could be. It could be that it actually did form in the same cloud as a companion star, perhaps, and the cloud sort of broke into two pieces as it was collapsing downwards. Um, the fact that it's in the star cluster means that we can t uh, pinpoint its age, which is something we don't often get to do with things like brown dwarfs that aren't a part of stellar clusters and things like that. So I got a question from Truck Captain Stumpy, which is, mm -hmm. uh, can we determine the type of gas con uh, content within the brown dwarf, hydrogen plus whatever? I mean, could we sort of get a sense maybe more about, like, based on what it was made out of? We would like to, but I don't think we have enough information about this particular object just yet. We don't have a spectrum of it. Uh, it's still primarily hydrogen and helium, like every other star that we've ever seen. But it's all of the, the other things, all of the other elements and other potential molecules in the atmosphere that really make the difference. And right. we don't have an idea of that yet. That is super cool. Okay, um, Morgan, let's talk about uh, China studies making babies in space. What? We're thinking sort of about how we're trying to spread humans out into the solar system and beyond. Uh, and it's you know a six or nine month trip to Mars. It's a several year trip out to uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune. And if we were to ever try to extend um, to other stars, it'd be a much longer trip than that. And if uh, there's one thing we sort of know about human nature, it's that if you put people together in one place for a long time, they're not going to try to uh, not make babies. And so there's this question, you know, what would happen if you tried to conceive um, a living thing in outer space? Uh, and the reason we ask this question is because we already know that space is bad for people. It weakens our muscles, uh, it changes the shape to our eyes, it has all sorts of negative effects, and that's for a fully developed, sort of fully rigid human being. What happens when you talk about uh, embryos? There are 
squishy. They're um, very much still in development. Uh, what effects does no gravity uh, have on them? This is actually an area that hasn't had a lot of research done in it, and uh, so China is taking the lead. And this past month, they launched a satellite for about two weeks, a spacecraft, uh, that carried a whole bunch of scientific experiments with it. And in, uh, then they brought it back down to Earth. And one of the things that they launched were 6,000 uh, mouse embryos. And they launched them basically right after fertilization, and then they were in space for a couple of uh, years, or excuse me, weeks, and then they brought them back down to Earth. And what they observed on Earth is that these mouse embryos, uh, after that period of time, appeared to be developing normally. Uh, and that says that in this sort of very critical, very first uh, moments of uh, development, uh, the effects of gravity are not critical to the effects of of developing life. Uh, now there's, this is very preliminary, there's still a question, well did all 6,000 succeed? Is the percentage of them that succeed lower than you would expect for a uh, fertilized mice embryo uh, here on Earth? And what would happen as you can continue? Maybe the first two weeks the organisms are too simple uh, to really see these changes manifest, but you have to bring uh, the embryo to full term in order to see that there is uh, sort of a cascading difference that goes on. Uh, and this is the first step, I would say, in what's going to be an expanded field of research, uh, because we are going to have to start to think about, well, what are the ethical uh, questions involved with uh, procreating in space, and what sorts of precautions, guidelines, et cetera, would we want to take uh, as we begin to put humans into longer and longer duration spaceflight? So, I mean, you say it's very preliminary, so does this give us good news for uh, trying to survive in space, uh, or does it give it, you know, is it still just too soon to tell? I think it is good news uh, in a sort of basic sense, in that space will not kill us, uh, but we have to imagine that for a human being to develop, uh, you know, go through childhood in space would not be a particularly good thing because if the astronauts who uh, are at the top of uh, health when they launch to the International Space Station come back with severely weakened bones uh, only a year later, then a child that is growing up in outer space and then lands down on a solid object uh, is not going to be able to cope with the stress of gravity. And this is, let's just be clear, this is very far future looking. We're not talking about going to the moon or going to Mars or anything like that. We're talking about what if we start to take long uh, sort of interstellar voyages and we, for whatever reason, aren't using artificial gravity. Uh, in that instance, it seems like human beings would be able to develop, but we don't know the, the ultimate effects that that would have on our body yet. And we may never know because it's difficult to imagine for a whole host of reasons that we would ever expose humans to years of time in zero gravity. But if, you know, if it does turn out to be very disastrous, you can imagine the implications for astronauts like say, forcing, maybe they already do this, I don't know, forcing astronauts to go on some kind of birth control or, you know, because the legal implications of of conceiving of a child that then, you know, has health defects because of spending time in weightlessness. Yeah, all space serious. agencies are very tight-lipped uh, when it comes to the question of sex in space. Uh, and we do know, however, that a number of female astronauts have gotten pregnant very shortly after returning to Earth, and so there appears to be no uh, sort of functional limitations uh, with respect to reproduction. Uh, but we don't know anything really about uh, conception in space, and because you know up to this point this hasn't been a big uh, problem. These are professionals um, that are going to space to do a job, and one doesn't expect to make babies on the job, and that's that. Uh, it's only as we continue sort of to go forward and expand the presence of humans in space that this will become uh, more of a question. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we've talked about a bit on this show as well is we don't even know 
if human beings can survive long term in low gravity, so the gravity of the moon or the gravity of Mars, we don't know if even that is lethal to human beings. It might be that the only place that human beings can live is in in space, is in some kind of structure that's being rotated to provide that artificial one gravity. In some ways, the only way to ever know any of these things uh, is going to be to try and to see what happens, and that's sort of the danger and the daring of exploration is that you've got to take a risk that you don't know the result of, but that's very different, I think, to most people uh, on sort of an ethical basis than exposing, you know, a, a child who never had the opportunity to choose to take that risk to that same sort of danger. Yeah, so it might be that the first colonists are going to have to have been sterilized or something like that to find out what the human body does and then take a bunch of pets, you know, they take their goats and they take some some animals to find out how, you know, what happens to living creatures before anyone attempts to conceive of a child and even raise them in that kind of a, of a situation. Um, uh, Matt Woods in the chat is mentioning that sort of it's pretty interesting, like they deal with that in The Expanse, that the, you know, the people from Earth and partly from Mars can go wherever they want, but the people who were raised in the belt, who were raised in the asteroids, they can never return to Earth because their bodies just can't handle the, the gravity. It's a, it's a really interesting uh, series. All right, Kimberly, let's talk about ultra-cool polar regions of the Venusian atmosphere. Sure. Yeah, so despite being our nearest planetary neighbor, we are still finding very surprising things out about Venus, simply because we have not studied it as much as we would like. But one of the last uh, atmospheric space probes to go to Venus was the European Space Agency's Venus Express, which unfortunately we lost contact with back in 2014, but we are still uh, getting, uh, we have, are still going through all the data that we got back from the Venus Express, and one of the things that we got was from the very last uh, experiment that it did right before we lost contact, which was its atmospheric drag experiment that it conducted near the poles of Venus. And now we, before Venus Express did this, we had never actually studied the poles of Venus in situ, only from the Earth, only from a distance. And while the Venus Express was going through the Venusian atmosphere and experiencing the atmospheric drag from the atmosphere itself, it was able to get a very detailed measurement of the density of the atmosphere and the temperature of the atmosphere at the poles uh, as a function of height. And we'd never ever done that before. And when we went through the data and studied it, we found that there are spots in the polar regions of Venus's atmosphere that are negative 157 degrees Celsius. That is colder than any place on Earth ever. And that's crazy because, you know, that's when we describe crazy. the temperature of Venus, we always talk about how it's ridiculously hot oh, yeah. at the How you can cook a frozen pizza the... in 18 seconds on the surface yeah. of Venus. At any it's... part. Like, you could be right. at the North Pole, and you cook your pizza. You'd be at the equator, you cook your pizza. You do it at night, you cook your pizza. You do it in the day, you cook your pizza. So right. the fact that, that you can do the, that, that it has these temperatures. You can freeze spots. that pizza. Yeah, you can freeze <laughs> that pizza. And then move it somewhere else and cook it. Right. So that, that highlights a very interesting point, is that we've studied the atmosphere of Venus in bulk from the Earth. But from Earth, we can only get so much. And so what we... and by sending space probes to Venus, we've only really focused on the equatorial regions of the atmosphere. And then we extrapolated that outwards to the polar regions and assumed that what happens in the equator happens, you know, at mid-latitude happens at the poles, it's all the same, simply because we didn't have measurements of it. And now looking back at the Venus Express data, we realize that the atmosphere of Venus is a lot more complicated than we originally thought which can have some pretty profound impacts on how we think about atmospheres of other planets as well. Right. That's absolutely that's absolutely amazing. Uh, this is like this is research that I never would have expected. Mm -hmm. um, Morgan, it, did you have your, any thoughts? Were you expecting this, or has this come out of left field? So when we talk about temperatures with respect to atmospheres, it can be a very strange thing. If you go up uh, 100 kilometers in the Earth's atmosphere, the temperature is like 1,000 degrees. And that might seem very, very counterintuitive, but that's because temperature is a measure of the average energy in a given region. And if you're in an area of the atmosphere that has like four particles, and they all have a lot of 
uh, energy, then you have a very high temperature. Now, you don't have a lot of heat because each one of those hitting you is only four particles. It's not a ton of, of particles, but you have a very high temperature. Uh, and the temperature profile in atmospheres of all kind kind of goes back and forth. And so the Earth's atmosphere starts out pretty warm uh, by the surface, and then it cools off as you go up, and then it gets warm again, and the temperature sort of zigzags back and forth. And that's what sets why the clouds form where they do, and why we have sort of the different uh, chemical species where we do. We have hydrogen in some areas and nitrogen in some areas and oxygen in other areas. And down close to the surface, it's pretty well mixed. But as you go up, it starts to get stratified. And that has all to do with the different levels of uh, temperature that we see. Uh, and so atmospheres are just very complicated. And if we understood them, we'd have perfect weather prediction. Uh, and obviously, we can't even predict the weather a week in advance here on Earth. And so it's not at all surprising to me that we found uh, another planet's atmosphere to be uh, a lot different than maybe we expected. Wow. Um, very, very cool. Um, cool. All right. Well, let's... Uh... It's been a crazy show, man. There's some really, really interesting news this week, and I'm uh, I'm both saddened and excited. So that's sort of the way I sort of balance balance out. I'm gonna take a couple of questions from the chat. Um, this one comes from Graham Ash, and you might not know the answer to this, uh, Morgan. Uh, didn't fruit flies reproduce on the ISS when they were there? So do you know what the sort of results of the ISS fruit fly experiments were? I think that that's correct that they did. Uh, the key sort of advance that China was working on here was mam mammals, mammalian life. Uh, and NASA has been very reticent to do extensive work with mammals on the International Space Station. Uh, and, of course, mammals are the branch of life most closely related uh, to human beings. And so I think we expect uh, things that work for mice to be much more likely to work for humans than, say, things that work for fruit flies. Right. Uh, this comes from Richard Strassel. Um, Kimberly, could there be sweet spots on Venus where landing probes might be more practical? There very well could be, simply because we have not studied most of Venus, either the atmosphere or the surface. I would be highly doubtful if there be any place that would be good for landing a probe I mean, there are certainly better places, like it's flatter and it's easier to move around. But despite the fact that we found these cooler points in the atmosphere, there's, they were still pretty high up in the atmosphere. And once you get down to the surface, I don't think those effects would travel all the way down to the surface temperature. Right, right. So it'll still be pretty difficult no matter where we land. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, I think we've sort of sort of reaching the end of our of our hour, so we should probably wrap things up. Uh, before we do, I want to make a big thanks, as always, to the WSH crew. This is the uh, the community that has enfolded uh, us and acts as our producers and our fans and our friends. And, uh, you know, you can find them. Just do a search for WSH crew. You can find all the locations, both their website and their Google Plus community. Uh, big thanks to them, especially to Nancy Graziano for helping to organize our guests. We really appreciate it. Uh, cool. So, uh, Kimberly, where do people find out more? People can find out more by following me on Twitter at AstroKimCartier or by checking out my website, KimberlyCartier.org. Morgan Renberg, where do people find out more? Well, if you're in the Denver area, I suggest you come by to Fisk Planetarium all day tomorrow for Astronomy Day, where I'll be giving talks on and off uh, all day. Otherwise, if you're not so close, you should follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg or visit my website, morganrenberg.com. And, of course, our special guest, Mike. And, Mike, uh, there's a – I don't know if you're with – there's a meteor shower going on right now, the Lyrids. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Matt Woods in the chat just wanted to mention that, so I thought uh, you uh, – do you have any information on the lyrics for people? Well, um, I haven't observed it myself. I heard it's kind of a minor shower. There aren't a lot there, but, you know, people like uh, meteors, especially the meteor showers, which is just a very cool phenomenon. You don't see, you know, just tons and tons of meteors, but they come from the same place, and it gives you that third dimension. You can see where they're coming from from the point in space, the swarm of material that's there. So even if it's a few here and there, it's a, it's a great uh, thing to do. It's, a, it's another way to see our neighbors in space coming in to visit us. 
And one last uh, mention where people can find out uh, more about Astronomers Without Borders. Astronomerswithoutborders.org and uh, everything we talked about is there, including Global Astronomy Month going on for the next, uh, what have you got, nine more days and new programs coming. Sign up for our newsletter, become a member, that's free. Well, we like paid members, but join and you can take part in the forum, post reports from wherever you are in the world about what you're doing and be a part of the world's biggest global astronomy community. Fantastic. Thanks again, Mike, for joining us. Once again, I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. If you haven't already, subscribe wherever that happens. Follow the the uh, the Twitters and the Facebooks and all of the and our Instagram. I I want to especially highlight the Instagram. I'm having a really good time with our Instagram channel. We've got takeovers that are happening every day where a different person takes over and posts a bunch of their astrophotos and it's a good time. So if you're an astrophotographer, get a hold of me and if you're not, just make sure you sign up to our our Instagram on uh, our Instagram channel. Uh, I'm supposed to say hello to Lucy. So I'm just doing that. Hi, Lucy. Uh, okay, thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you all next week. Bye.